And now from the Tech Center, here's Katie Osborne. Welcome to a very special Power Nation. I'm Katie Osborne and you are watching the Detroit Muscle Top 10 Muscle Car List, dedicated to the muscle car era. And how could we go any further without the help of these two guys, Mark and Tommy from Detroit Muscle. Hey, thanks, Katie. We've been looking forward to this one for a while. We asked the viewers to give us a list of their top picks, and it's time to reveal. So your number one car oh, is whoa, the... Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on. We have a lot more business to take care of first, or else this would be one very short show. We also have our friend and co-host of Truck Tech, Jeremy Bumpus, here to help us out. Jeremy? Thanks, Katie. This top 10 countdown is exciting, but there are some cars that didn't make the list. So we have a place of honorable mention for them. That's coming up in just a bit. Thanks, Jeremy. And before we really get started, how do you actually define muscle car? Well, that's a question that's been up for debate for a really long time. That's right, but we made it easy for you. America has always had a love affair with the automobile, the open road, and speed. Back in 1964, gas was cheap and the big three car manufacturers were developing new models that were attainable and fast. So defining a muscle car is easy. It's an American-made two-door, V8-powered, rear-wheel drive, high-performance vehicle built from the mid-60s to the early 70s. That's right, for almost a decade, the big three produced more than 80 different models that personified the American passion for ruling the open road with power and style. Now, I then have a question. What is considered the first muscle car? Well, I'm glad you asked, but that's a whole lot to cover. So strap in, hold on, and let's kick this pig and get the countdown started with number 10. At the beginning of the muscle car era, somebody had to take a real chance to appeal to the speed-minded youth market. And that would be Pontiac. Few renegades in the company ignored corporate policy against stock car racing and packed a massive 389 cubic inch engine into a small, lightweight model. And thus, the GTO was born. I'm here with my 64 GTO. It's a post car, factory 389 tri-power four-speed. My dad, he, he brought it home on a trailer uh, in pieces when I was 14. Said this is gonna be my first car. It was intended to just really be just a, you know, kind of put it together as a driver. And as we got into it, you know, we obviously went a little overboard for an everyday driver in restoring it. Considered by many to be the first muscle car, it was the shot heard round Detroit. Pontiac essentially took an old man's car, the Tempest, and made it cool with big power, a three-speed Hurst shifter, sport suspension, wide wheels, hood scoops, dual exhaust, and special badging and took it to the streets. This is the car that I learned how to work on cars. The GTO opened the door for everyone that was waiting to produce a sexy road beast that was affordable, mean, and fun to drive. Drives like it from the 60s. I, I built the car back, all original, manual brakes, manual steering. Goes great when you're going straight. I think that's what it was built for. My dad had 30 to 40 GTOs over the years, I'm, I'm guessing. Of course, uh, then he brought this car home for me. That's been my favorite passion all, all these years. Available in a two-door coupe, hard top, and convertible body styles, the GTO became an overnight performance success that would speak to the new muscle car generation. And obviously, anyone with a pulse would be hard pressed not to love the measure of grab and go this car had to offer. Certainly it's not a torque monster compared to many of today's modern muscle masters, but who can deny what Pontiac started? You be the judge. Oh wait, that's a different story. Wow, what a great way to kick off the countdown. Oh yeah, that dog will hunt. And I got a hunch I know what car is gonna be number one. Hmm, care to give uh, all of us a clue? No, nah, don't fall for that, Katie, because you might just miss out on what's coming up next. The fun continues with Power Nation on the road, top 10 muscle cars.
Power Nation on the Road is brought to you by SummitRacing.com, America's headquarters for high-performance parts. By Edelbrock, high performance made in the USA. Go to edelbrock.com for more. And by Original Parts Group, your parts source for over 30 years. Get your free catalog at opgi.com. Thanks so much for joining us as we are counting down the top 10 muscle cars that you voted on. Jeremy Bumpus will join us in a few to talk about a couple that didn't quite make the list. But for now, here's a piece of muscle that's known to be quite a torque monster. Here's number nine. Mustangs. You can either love them or hate them, but you can't deny their place in history, especially in the case of the 69 428 Cobra Jet. 1969 was the year of first. First man on the moon, first passenger flight for the Boeing 747, and this was the first generation for the Mach 1. Mach 1s were very popular, classy, and were offered with different engine packages and options. But it was the 428 Cobra Jet that made a statement. It's like nothing else. It takes you back. I mean, if you were young when you first got in a car like that, it takes you straight back to those days. It's as if the Ford design team said, we need sexy, sleek, sinister, with a sport roof, side scoops, spoiler and stripes, the Jackrabbit Fat. Rated at 335 horses, the 428s were delivering more like 400 horses and over 450 foot-pounds of torque. Size matters. Don't let anybody tell you it doesn't. That means it would likely leave you in a cloud of smoke at the stoplight. This new Mach 1 Pony came with all the goods. Classic Mustang body lines, a fastback top with rear window louvers and rear spoiler. Side scoops along with headlamps in the front grille. Sealing the deal was a set of hood pins, the two-tone Mach 1 badging, and the icing on the cake, a functional shaker hood scoop. You see, Ford wasn't messing around in the days of the performance wars. This big block beast was a force to be reckoned with on the streets as well as the track. The interior package is crisp and clean with a generous layout of the wood grain dash and gauges. Easy on the eyes, the Mach 1 still has the sassy look of the first ponies, but if you ever see a shaker hood scoop on a 69 Fastback, watch your step. Mach 1s might be known for the rally days, but a 428 Cobra will deal a deadly bite to just about anything that picks a fight with it off the line. You know, Tommy, I never really picked you as a Mustang guy. Well, I don't like to play favorites, and with a great list like that, it's hard to pick just one, and we're only on number nine. Oh, right. You're a Chevy guy. Well, I see what you're trying to do. You're trying to get my number one pick. Well, when you put it that way. There's enough time for all that, but as for right now, it's time for the king. Taking care of business, here's number eight. Roll out the red carpet, muscle car fans. The king is in town. No, I'm not talking about Elvis, but I am talking about the king of the road. In 1968, the infamous Shelby GT500 KR or King of the Road was made in limited numbers. Only about 1,200 KRs were made for production of the roughly 4,400 Shelbys made that year. The 68 KR stayed true to the Shelby design, but featured a unique fiberglass hood, and Shelby was anything but modest about plastering his name all over his masterpiece. The good looks aren't what got this car titled King of the Road. 428 Cobra Jet that pushes this snake down the road might have something to do with it. Officially, Shelby claimed the King only had 335 horses kicking around between the massive eight cylinders. But guys in the know and anyone who has ever pushed the loud pedal on one of these knows that 335 is nothing but a low ball number to keep insurance affordable. A pair of power front disc brakes and oversized drums in the back along with a 16 to one power steering ratio, keeps the cavalry under control. The C6 transmission, reinforced shock towers, and staggered rear shocks may have helped with the name as well. Now, rumor has it that the name, King of the Road, was swiped from GM. But you Chevy guys can talk all you want. Stolen name or not, 
This car has got a set of 15 inch wheels out back, which keeps the king reigning over his domain. These cars were packed full of options. Sequential blinkers out back were touched off with chrome trim and bumpers, and the dual exhaust announced the arrival of this nobility. Up front, a classic Shelby front end with four big lamps and a massive scoop to keep the big block Cobra Jet cool. The hood rams air down the throat of this hungry 735 CFM Holly. And the stripes, well, they just look cool. These cars were meant to race, and inside, the safety was a key component. Inertia reel shoulder harnesses and seat belts hold the driver and passenger securely in place, while a roll bar runs overhead just in case. Style was not far behind safety. The deluxe all vinyl interior complete with bucket seats was set off with a walnut grained instrument and door panels. A full set of gauges including an 8,000 rev tack and a speedo capable of reaching 140 miles per hour are a constant temptation for a heavy right foot. Whether or not Shelby swiped the name King of the Road from GM, this Cobra rightfully earned the title. Big Ford power, coupled with Shelby racing style and engineering, commands respect from any would-be challenger. Wow, King of the Road indeed. And Jeremy Bumpus from Truck Tech is here. Jeremy, what'd you think of that? Well, even though I work on a lot of trucks, I have to say, got a soft spot for old school muscle. So, you're telling me you're a Mustang guy? You know, Tommy told me you were gonna try to pin me down on my pick. Hmm. News travels fast. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you this much. There is a real king of the road, but let's not forget there are some muscle cars that didn't make this list, like this Mercury Cyclone Spoiler 2. Back in the day, Mercury wanted to compete with the aero cars in NASCAR. They had the power, but aerodynamics would help you get to the finish line first. The Cyclone Spoiler 2's nose was lengthened and pinched with a flush-mounted grille and tight-fitting bumper. Then the rockers were reshaped to allow the car to sit low to the track. It's a lot of car, but didn't make the top 10 list, much like these honorable mentions we have for you now. Our first honorable mention goes to the 69 Chevy Camaro Z28. Specifically designed for Trans Am racing, it combines small block performance with road hugging agility, earning it the nickname, The Hugger. Track ready with street manners, the Z28 produced upwards of 375 horses with a zero to 60 time of just 7.4 seconds. The cow induction hood, rally stripes, concealed headlights, and plenty of chrome gave the Z28 a real aggressive, cool look so it's truly honorable. Also worth an honorable mention is one of the most recognizable cars of the muscle car era. The 69 Dodge Daytona broke the speed barrier for Chrysler at the track and challenged the appearance notion for many buyers. This car was engineered for one thing, winning races. The pinch nose, modified body panels, and giant rear wing were all added to streamline the car, allowing it to hug the track at speed. Buddy Baker was the first driver to break 200 miles per hour at the track. NASCAR co-founder Bill France thought the car was dangerous and dealerships couldn't sell it. A track warrior that set several automotive firsts, the Daytona is honorable indeed. The 64 Ford Fairlane Thunderbolt was the drag strip demon. It was a limited production drag race only car produced by Ford in 1964. The Thunderbolt formula was simple, big power and a little car. The Monster 427 was rated at 425 horses and it made upwards to 600 in race two, but it was heavy. So fiberglass was used for the hood and fenders. The bumpers and grill were aluminum and the windows were made of plexiglass. Just bare essentials on the inside. No heater, no radio, no carpet. Just some van seats, a four-speed, and a tack. Impressive? Yes. Practical for the street? <laughs> no. But who said muscle needs to be practical? That was a great piece, Jeremy. Well, if you like that, you're going to want to stick around because we have another honorable mention coming up later on. I'm looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. And Tommy, Mark, and I have a special treat for everybody that will take us right up to number one. The real question. Can we get a hint? 
Well, let's just say there are car collectors, and there are real car collectors. Well, you heard them. Stick around, because we're counting them down. After this break, it's order in the court. All rise. Just so you're up to speed on the top 10 countdown, coming in at number 10. We started with the 1964 GTO Tri-Power. Number nine was a Power Pack and Pony, the 1969 Mustang 428 Cobra Jet. Warming up the streets was number eight, the 1968 Shelby GT500 KR. And that brings us to number seven. Mark, Tommy, bring us up to speed. In the early 60s, at the beginning of the muscle car era, building an affordable high performance car was key. Now fast forward toward the end of the decade, our next road warrior was one of the most expensive muscle cars to roll out of Detroit. And some might say, how can you put a price on high performance? I think the best way to put it is, all rise, here comes the judge. Beautifully formed steel, a mixture of battleship ego and smart mouth sass. Pontiac's The Judge GTO was a concept developed by John DeLorean. DeLorean started with an intermediate sized platform and added a big V8 with enough torque to pull a freight train. Added some performance and luxury options, but what to call it? The Judge was borrowed from a comedy line used in a popular TV show, Laugh In. DeLorean said yes, Let's give them the judge. The younger generation in the muscle car era, they wanted uh, more power. They wanted faster cars, and they gave me faster cars. That's what they gave them. And the old saying back in those days and is what wins on race day sells on Monday. Designed to compete with the Plymouth Roadrunner, Pontiac actually gave you less for more money. For an extra 300 bucks, they took stuff off the GTO and called it a weight reduction option. Clever, but no cutting corners as far as style goes. The design team was hard at work. Just look at the color and those groovy graphics. Now aside from the color scheme, Pontiac's strongest feature was under the hood. The judge was going up against the Hemis and the Chevy big blocks of the day. So the top engine option was the big and beefy Ram Air 4. This 400 cubic inch ground pounder was not just your run of the mill big V8. It was a performance beast rated at 370 horsepower, but was more like 400 horses. The Ram Air feature utilized an upper and lower pan to direct maximum airflow. With enough snap off the line punch to give you a case of whiplash, the Ram Air 4 delivered 445 foot pounds of torque almost as much torque as a first-gen Dodge Viper. Loud and proud, this goat screams anything but subtle. The design team launched with a carousel red paint scheme and plenty of decals and badging, so you knew the judge was in town. The Endura nose piece, rear spoiler, hood-mounted tack, functional Ram Air scoops, hearse shifter, and plush bucket seats. Everything needed for a full floor show. The regular GTO was nice, a version with the Ram Air 3 was sweet, but the judge with the Ram Air 4 says I'm here, now let the party begin. Thanks Tommy, we keep counting them down, but the good news is there's still plenty more. All right Mark, what's next on the list? Katie, at the peak of the muscle car era, sports coupes were big, and General Motors rushed to market a feisty little pony car called Camaro. The 67 and 68 models sold well, but it was the 69 Camaro that is arguably the most popular Camaro of all time. And the 69 RS SS396 delivered it all. Power and sex appeal, this Camaro is a perfect combination of what happens when performance meets style and swagger. If you ordered one of these, chances are you're not worried about the price. The guy who bought this car wasn't worried about price. 
you know. Then a $100 option was like a $1,000 option today. So he really didn't care. He wanted what he wanted and, and wanted the best looking SS396 could buy. The Super Sport or SS package is a step up from stock, but to upgrade to the L78 396 option, you have to be really ready to open your wallet. This high performance contender is 396 cubic inches of pure street muscle. Rated at 375 horses and 410 pound-feet of torque, it's likely you'd be ready for any grudge match. There are plenty who prefer the SS package strictly because in a street fight, nobody cares how much fancy chrome you've got. On the other hand, if bling is your thing, the Rally Sport or RS trim package includes all the eye candy. Special black painted grille with concealed headlights, hockey stick fender striping, simulated rear fender louvers, front and rear wheel moldings, badging, and plenty of bright work. The Rally Sport trim package puts you in the high roller category. You know, what was really cool of Chevrolet is, is the amount of options available to a customer. They really blanketed the whole segment of buyers. You know, if you wanted a base car with a straight six in it, you know, to drive back and forth to work, you could do that all the way up to a Copo, you know, you could, they, they really covered the whole spectrum for everybody. Finding a 69 Camaro 396 with both the RS and SS packages is like a unicorn. You get a rare combination of the most lavishly equipped Camaro with the big block performance of a drag car combined. It's one of America's greatest pony cars that continues to be celebrated. Iconic because it's rare, but also because people love them. Of course, we can't mention the 69 Camaro without talking a little bit about the Copo. Copo stands for Central Office Production Order. It's a special order right from the factory. Only 69 were ever produced and 50 came from one single dealership. And what made these cars special was under the hood. It was an ultra lightweight fire breathing dragon, the Z01 427 to be more specific. Making 430 horses, it was only available in a Corvette unless you filled out that special order paperwork so Chevy wouldn't catch on. You see, GM didn't want to overshadow that Corvette. Well, it's two more heavy hitters down and we're halfway through this countdown. Stay tuned as the top 10 muscle car list continues. Welcome back to the Detroit Muscle Top 10 Muscle Car List, and in case you've missed it, here's a recap. Starting us off, we had the original muscle car, the 1964 Pontiac GTO Tri-Power at number 10. Number nine was a big pony, the 69 Mustang 428 Cobra Jet. Votes tallied up gave us the 1968 Shelby-inspired GT500 KR at number eight. The number seven pick, we see Pontiac return again with the 69 GTO Judge Ram Air 4. And number six, a bow tie favorite, the 69 Camaro RS SS 396. So much muscle, so little time. Let's take a look at a car that's a favorite among Mopar fans alike. Here's number five. In 1968, Chrysler had to come up with something that was a fresh and powerful new design. The newly redesigned 68 Dodge Hemi Charger RT was born. Curves in all the right places and a punch that could only be delivered by a Hemi. The Hemi has always been the pinnacle engine and is named for the hemispherical combustion chambers in the heads. That's where the real Mopar magic happens. This ultra-rare 68 RT is actually a real 12,000-mile survivor. A survivor is basically an unrestored car, uh, a car with original paint, uh, mostly original interior, that kind of stuff. It can have some minor repair work, that kind of stuff, but uh, it has to be mostly original. Dodge has always set itself apart from other car makers in several ways, and this new RT design carried over into the 69 and 70 models with most notably the optional 446 pack in the 70 model. 1970 was the first time the six pack was offered on the Charger. You could only order it in the RT and just 684 got it. The 
three deuces helped churn out 390 horsepower, and it had more low-end torque than the Hemi. It was a 446 pack, much like the one growling beneath the hood of this 70 Charger RT. Hurst pistol grip shifter gave you marksman-like control. RTs were made for road or track, so you got extra heavy-duty suspension rolling on a set of wide tread tires. Plus, there was that nifty race-style gas cap. Built as a fastback on the Cornette chassis, it was part street machine and part family car. It sold okay, but really took off in 68 when the second gen was unveiled. Sleeker body lines and more aggressive front end gave it that signature look. The 70 Charger was the last of the second gen design and changes were subtle. It still had those nifty hidden headlights, but a new wraparound chrome bumper was added. RT models now had simulated side scoops. In the rear, the taillight housing stretched the full width of the tail panel. Inside the Charger, Dodge offered several options, including vinyl bucket seats, a dash full of instruments, including tack and speedo for ease of sight, and some fancy power options. The second generation Charger RTs carried Dodge into history as one of the most recognizable cars ever produced. Agree or disagree, the 68 to 70 Charger RTs are more popular than ever, but one thing's for sure, the 68 Hemi RT still wears the crown. All right, you Mopar fans have had a taste, but the countdown isn't over yet. Who knows which car will make it to the fourth position? We'll find out soon, but first, Jeremy has a few other cars that deserve some special recognition. Thanks, Katie. Street Muscle comes in several different flavors, so let's take a look at a few more we just couldn't leave out. Here are some more honorable mention two-seaters. In 1965, Carroll Shelby raised the performance bar by stuffing a 7-liter, 450-horse big block into a Cobra body. The result? Absolute overkill. The brutally quick 427 Cobra SC featured an aluminum skin with track-ready fuel door, roll bar, wide wheel flares, huge tires, and competition side pipes. It's a 160 mile an hour race car with a license plate, and only 316 were built. If you ever get an opportunity to drive a real 427 Cobra, you better jump on it, because it could be a truly honorable experience. The 67 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray was a last and fitting close to the second gen Corvette. The 427 Big Block was rated at 435 horses, but the actual horsepower rating could have been rated well over 550. Now to many, the 67 was the pinnacle achievement for its handling, road grip, and sheer power. Never short on looks, the Stingray options included alloy wheels, five slotted side fender vents, retractable headlights, and lots of chrome. Plenty of show and go. The sexy muscle of the 67 Stingray is honorable by any standard. Also worth an honorable mention is the 1970 American Motors Experimental Two-Seater. The AMC AMX was built on a Javelin floor plan with a 390 cubic inch, 325 horse V8. The car's signature look came with a functional Ram Air hood, flush mount grille, flying buttress roof line, and steep angled rear glass. A powerful short wheelbase two-seat pony car. The AMX was positioned by some as a serious Corvette competitor, just cheaper. A real deal at the track and on the streets, the 1970 model is thought as one of the last real AMX that would do zero to 60 in just over six and a half seconds. Plenty of muscle, but sales never flourish. So for now, we'll have to leave it in history as another honorable mention. Katie, I know we're getting closer to number one, and all I can say is I've got my money on, let's just say, the real king of the road. Thanks, Jeremy. Now, do you guys have any idea what he's talking about? No, and apparently he don't either. Now, we've all got our pick for number one. Sure you do too, but that's gonna be a little later when we reveal our top three. And one cool thing for us is, well, all of them were in the same spot. Hmm, now that sounds like a road trip to me. Oh, the best kind, but that's gonna be a little later on, so you wanna stick around. But first, we're gonna reveal number four. Welcome back to the Detroit Muscle Top 10 Muscle Car List. 
Now we've just made it from number 10 to number four. So if you've just tuned in, here's what you've missed. At number 10, we have the original muscle car, the 64 Pontiac GTO Tri-Power. Number nine was a favorite pony, the 1969 Mustang 428 Cobra Jet. Number eight was a more popular pony, the 1968 Shelby-inspired GT500 KR. At number seven, Pontiac returned with the 69 GTO Judge Ram Air 4. Number six, a bow tie favorite, the 69 Camaro RS SS 396. And Mopar made a showing at number five with the 68 Hemi Charger RT. Now, Tommy, we're getting close to the number four pick, so how does this Mopar fit in? Katie, this is the 1970 Dodge Super B, essentially the cousin to our number four car. They took a base model and stripped it down, but added power and performance. The Super B is based on the Coronet and had several high performance engine options. This one has the 383, but you could go with the larger engine options, like the 446 pack, which leads us to our number four car. How many cars could you just purchase right off the showroom floor and take it to the drag strip and win? Well, that's exactly what you could do with the 1969 Plymouth Roadrunner 446 pack. But look at it. It's boxy with limited options, no trim, no hubcaps, no power steering, flat black liftoff fiberglass hood with an oversized scoop and bench seat. Who would buy it? A bunch of folks, actually. This original 69 Roadrunner with just 9,000 miles packed everything under the hood for somebody looking to settle a score on the street or at the drag strip. This car is all original, uh, probably one of the best paint cars we have. Plymouth wanted to produce a super fast, no frills beast, and Motor Trend would end up naming it Car of the Year. By 1970, Speedimus Maximus was the street moniker for the Roadrunner. Many a Ford and Chevy spent time chasing down the bird car, but like the Coyote, they had a hard time catching it. What I like about driving the car is, is how it handles. The car handles great. The engine has never came out of the car. It still runs excellent. Power in this bird is a 383 four barrel, which hammers out 335 horsepower. For some extra dough, you could throw in a 446 pack or Hemi if you really wanted to leave them in the dust. If Lester's out on the road and wants a little extra oomph, he just flips the switch under the dash and up pops the air grabber scoop to suck in some cool air. Plymouth made a few cosmetic changes this year, like moving the badge from the door up to the front fender. This one features the optional gold dust trail. Body lines were smoothed out and side scoops were molded into the rear quarters. They also got new grills with vertical fins and a Plymouth emblem for the first time. Bumpers now featured integrated turn signals and the taillights were split into two narrow slivers. Now it wouldn't be a Roadrunner without that signature. <laughs> Plymouth engineers spent thousands of dollars designing a horn that sounded just right. The Roadrunner kicked off Mopar's signature cartoon cars, which included the Super B, the Duster, and the Demon. It was a budget-minded muscle car coming in at around three grand. The 383 was standard along with the heavy-duty brakes and suspension. An optional rear spoiler shows this bird is ready to fly. So what's left to say about this piece of muscle? Matching speed with eye-popping looks really turned this car into a living cartoon. And the A12 version with its stripped down approach to performance is what makes this rare bird so popular to this day. There you go, Mopar fans. You picked two in a row, and there's only three left to go. But which three are they? Well, I think this is a better story told by Tommy, Jeremy, and Mark. Thanks, Katie. We've made it to the top three of our list, and it's because of you guys and your votes that we've been able to put this great list together. And the next three cars are the top dogs, and we were lucky enough to find them all in one place. Only problem was they were in Moline, Illinois. But who can resist a road trip? Not these guys. So we loaded up and headed north. The guys are on the road and will bring you your top three picks. The fun continues with Power Nation on the road, top 10 muscle cars.
I think it's time to revisit the guys on their road trip to find the number one muscle car. Yes, sir. Oh, you guys do. You all you guys do there. is complain. Sure. I'm telling you, that's well, all you do. Trust me on this one, right. it's gonna be worth it. It sure, it better be for sure. No, 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 stop talking and be home. Some of you may have already known what our top three are. I've got my pick and it is this, 1969 Ford Mustang, Boss 429. Now these two other boys are gonna tell you why they think their car is number one, but there can only be one Kingfish, and it has to be the 1970 Hemi Cuda. And the top of the list for me is this 1970 Chevy Chevelle SS LS6. And I mean, think about it, Chevy was the only company to come up with an original name, the Chevelle. That one's named after a horse, and that one after a fish. Well, not only were we lucky enough to get all three cars in one place, but they're all owned by one man. Would you call him a muscle car enthusiast? You may call him a car collector. Well, we just call him Les Bear. The looks of them and the performance, they're just really nice to look at. People will pull up alongside you with their cell phones, start hanging out the windows and taking photos and almost running you off the road because they don't see them anymore. The thing that attracted a lot of people to muscle cars, one thing I noticed is, like if I go to a cruising, I'll take one of the Boss 429s or maybe a Hemi Cuda, is the young people, the kids, when they come up and see these cars, what surprises me sometimes is how much they know about the old cars. And I'll ask them, where did you learn all this? They said, we read all the magazines, and now that we're you know, 15, 16 years old, even younger, they're into that type of stuff and they love it, love to see it when it's going down the road. Now there's only one thing cooler than a bright orange Hemi Cuda, and that would be two of them. Now Mopar has been known to do a few things to kind of separate themselves from the pack. For example, this car has the optional black vinyl top that's got the alligator print on it. Now a few of you guys may call it a little bit quirky, I'm gonna call it real nice. In 1970, there were several honorable muscle cars, and then there was the big dog, the Chevelle SS LS6. Now, if you Google muscle car, you'll see that the 70 Chevelle SS shows up top for good reason. This is arguably the most popular Chevelle, due in part to its King Kong motor. Then there's all of the visual goodies from the cool cow induction scoop to the streamlined style fit and finish, available options, it all worked together. So we're in a 1970 Chevelle SS LS6 car. In 1970, this thing was the king of the streets. It's got a 454 that's rated at 450 horsepower and 500 pound-feet of torque. So that little pony car back there, yeah, I don't think it's gonna hang. But, you know, I'd probably buy that for my sister and I'd maybe give my mom that Cuda. <laughs> Chevelle, more like Michelle. Now, when you start arguing which is the biggest, baddest muscle car ever, well, you gotta respect the Hemi. Now, there's people out there that I ask, hey, that thing got a Hemi in it? They don't even know what that means, but they know that it means it's a pretty serious thing. The 1970 Hemi Cuda was widely accepted as one of the most sought after muscle cars for some very good reasons. First, look at the classic shape. Plymouth redesigned it with a lower, wider stance, then added plenty of design accents. So instead of saying a simple pony car, the 1970 Cuda was transformed into a full-time muscle car. Another reason, it's a Hemi. It's rare, it's 425 horses, worth of tire shredding American performance. And you know, that Cuda has that Hemi, so that's an elephant of an engine, but, the Mustang, it's a Hemi wannabe. It's a semi-Hemi with hemispherical head. So they were trying to do something there to be fast, but there's no replacement for displacement. This thing is the king of the road. No, guys, no, no, no. Listen, you may have 
450 horses in that LS6 Chevelle, but you also weigh as much as a pickup truck. I mean, heck, that thing's over two tons. The Boss 429 is the best of both worlds, looks and performance. Why wouldn't it be the number one muscle car? It's sexy, fast, and rare. The style alone makes it one of the best looking by default. This asphalt stripping street fighter with its wide tires, bulging fenders, and serious hood scoop gives us some hint of the beast that's under the hood. Simple and clean, out of all the muscle cars ever produced, it's hard to imagine that any can match up with the Boss 9. Old Jeremy Chevelle is kind of what I would call a full-figured car. Kind of like this. Just think, this car wouldn't exist if Ford hadn't needed that engine to run a NASCAR. Now I got a couple of jokes for you two out there. You could look behind us and see them. It's that Chevelle and that Mustang. I wonder what that SS means. I wonder if that's like soft sofa, super slow, sassy sissy. No way, man. This thing has 500 pound feet of torque. Are you kidding me? Man, that, that Mustang looks good in this rear view mirror. That's a normal place. Let's face it, Tommy. That Cuda you're driving only exists because the Mustang exists. Getting to ride around in these three cars is a joy all of its own. But we wound up finding us a car show, Les Luck may have it, and it's for a good cause. That's right, this is the Princeton Emergency Responders Car Show, and we're here in Princeton, Iowa, on the mighty Mississippi River. First responders are the backbone of this community, much like everywhere, and this car show helps to fund the efforts of those who put their lives on the line. So I'm gonna walk around a little bit and just get some random people and get their impression on which car they think should be number one. Hey man. How's it going? Take a look at our top three muscle cars and tell us which one you think should be number one. Sure. Let's go. Get a Chevelle. Chevelle's pretty awesome. It's hard to beat a Chevelle. It is. But then you got a Hemi Cuda. I mean, Real that's deal. a tough car to beat. But let's dig behind it. You got a Boss 9. Uh, unbiased opinion. I'm gonna go with Boss 9. I don't blame you. Well, we've done all we can do to show you guys what we think which car should be number one, but uh, it's time for us to head back south. So we'll see you guys back at the studio and find out which one of these three cars will be number one. It looks like you guys had a great time in Iowa and a big shout out to all the first responders there. Well, as I say, it's all over but the crying. And coming up, we're gonna reveal your number three, your number two, and of course, your number one pick in the Detroit Muscle Top 10 Muscle Car List. Stay tuned. Power Nation On The Road is brought to you by Royal Purple, the performance motor oil that outperforms. Details at royalpurple.com. By EBC Brakes, step up from stock and get up to 30% more stopping power. And by SummitRacing.com, America's headquarters for high performance parts. Welcome back, we hope you've enjoyed our top 10 countdown. And as you've just seen, Tommy, Mark, and Jeremy have all made very compelling arguments as to why their car should be number one. It was a whole lot of fun, but it doesn't really matter what we think because you guys, the viewers out there, have voted and that's what's important. Well, that's enough of the chit chat. Let's just get down and reveal the number three car. A respectable position. The Boss 429 will arguably always be a heavy contender. All right, moving on to second place, guys. You voted and coming in the second spot. The Chevelle SS LS6. It's an awesome car with a loyal following and that deserves a prominent place in history. So now, this leaves us with the number one voted pick. And Tommy, you guessed it. The 1970 Hemi Cuda. It's a distinction that is worthy and it's exciting for all the Mopar fans out there. But more importantly, I was right because I told you 
and I told you that you can't beat that Hemi. All right, I'm gonna let them celebrate and we appreciate all of your votes. A big thanks to our car owners, Princeton, Iowa first responders, car club members, our crew, and of course, all of our sponsors. I'm Katie Osborne and for everyone here at Power Nation, thanks for watching.